it's already hard enough. And if you don't have concrete milestones and concrete ways to communicate with your stakeholders on where you're going and how you're going to get there, it's even harder. And so what I've learned throughout the years is that 10 seems to be a good heuristic of when you are reaching some market traction, meaning when you're building a B2B product, you have to go through the sales cycle of your customer, the installation, maybe a pilot project. And not until you deploy a few systems, you know if you're actually delivering on that value, right? Getting the sale is not validation enough. And what I've encountered throughout my experience and talking to hundreds of people is that 10 is a good number of if you're able to deliver value to 10 customers, then you have evidence of uh, market traction. Welcome to Innovation Talks. Join us weekly as we discuss with distinguished industry guests how to refine and improve corporate innovation and new product development. Hosted by Paul Heller, Sophion Chief Evangelist. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for joining us again. Hope you're all having a great week and uh, you're enjoying the days of summer. We have a guest today, Daniel Elizalde, and Daniel's got a, a neat background in, in terms of innovation. Uh, he's written a book. Uh, we'll get to all of that in a little bit, but uh, Daniel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Yeah, glad you could join us. And where are you joining us from today? I'm based in Austin, Texas, and as you know, we're going through this uh, heat wave, so yeah. it's it's nice and warm, 108 Today, 108 so, so that's uh what's well, just like 42 degrees celsius for our our european friends so yeah that's it's, it's too hot it's very hot here in austin the, yeah. we say that we only have two seasons the heat season and the football season so <laughs> well it's an indoor activity to talk to us today and we're glad you joined us so yeah. <laughs> thank so, you for so having Daniel, me uh, tell us a little bit about i was reading about your background a little bit but i think it's always better to hear from from people themselves how did you get involved in innovation and some of the things you've done along the way for sure thanks for asking i'm originally from mexico city I studied uh, electronics engineering in school, and then I was lucky to get my first job here in Austin, actually. Um, and from the very beginning, I've always been in this, um, walking this fine line between engineering and product management. So m my roles have been around that. Um, and I've worked in, in many companies, large and small, from, from manufacturing to renewable energy, to energy storage, to e-commerce, automotive, telecommunications. And for one reason or another, I've always found myself in the innovation areas of these companies, always working with the early products. Even though I worked as head of products for a energy storage company in Silicon Valley, so that's a new product, purely innovation. But I've also worked, for example, as a vice president or head of IoT for Ericsson, and I was in their innovation group. So even though it's a mature company with mature products, I was in the innovation groups. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I'm a mentor for startups, so innovation. And so one way or another, I, I kind of gravitate to that. And, and by talking about these things now, I'm like, somehow my whole career has been in early stage products. So that's, somehow that's how you were me. drawn to it. Yeah, somehow I really enjoyed that initial stage. And I had the opportunity to work in later stage products and I realized that I uh, I don't enjoy that much the the just the maintenance and the growth aspect of a established product I really like the early stages of the early stage understanding the market and everything it's, it yeah intends. yeah and when were you when were you working in the IOT areas at, at Ericsson uh, it was about uh, three or four years ago yeah when I was living still in Silicon Valley and uh, I was the, the head of the of IoT for North America, and we were driving the uh, D15 uh, innovation lab there. The whole idea is was around innovation with IoT and 5G. That was my core area. Yeah, it's really a hot area, and it's it's it's. Uh, I was talking to a, an analyst firm about it recently. And they were taking the next step of, okay, now we have all this data. Now we have too much data, right? How can we make sense of the data? So that's a pretty, pretty fun area to have been in. Yeah, it is. And, and um, the other constant that I've seen, uh, not only innovation, but I've always been in the cutting edge technologies. So I've always worked in IoT and 5G and cloud early on. And so it's uh, energy storage early on. And so it's it's been 
innovation of emerging technologies? And then more importantly, how do you build a business around that? There you go. There you go. And what's one of your favorite stories uh, that you kind of along the way you look back and say, oh, I got a great story. I bet you have a few. <laughs> I have a ton, actually. Um, and <laughs> that was that was a lot of the fun of writing my my book, the B two B Innovators Map. That it, every chapter has a bunch of stories, and they're all real stories. A little bit massaged for the book, right? But they're all real stories. So I've had the opportunity to work in very strenuous applications, so to speak, right? Like I mentioned, I was in energy storage and infrastructure for the grid. But I've also done some weird applications, like testing of the structure of a ship to make sure that it's not going to flip over when it's mm -hmm. at sea. And so the modeling of all that, um, I've worked in um, military applications of uh, like fighter jets, or I worked in applications that have to do with the Mars rover, the landing systems, uh, or I worked in applications that have to do with detecting mines in fields that used to be war fields. And now you're sending unmanned vehicles to detect those mines. And so I worked on those applications and I've been in diamond mines in South Africa or inside the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Uh, so all these weird things and, you know, I've done some, a lot of commercial stuff, but yeah. some of this always uh, are, are good conversation starters, right? I bet they are. I mean, how many people have been in a, a linear accelerator? Not many. <laughs> Not many. And I was actually standing at the, at the, um, <clears throat> at this, at the center where they do the, the, the collection and the, and so I, I have some pictures there. Wow. It was incredible. It was, it's a, an incredible thing. I'm, I'm a physics aficionado. So being there was, Indeed. was amazing. Great, great, and then and then so you you wrote this book, you put your book together, which is fairly new, yes. isn't it? Yes, uh, today is uh, four weeks. Four weeks, good. Yeah, good. four weeks that it that it launched, so it's uh, it's a fairly new. I'm very very excited to to hit that milestone. And you call it the B two B Innovators Map. So tell us about that. Of course, thank you, thank you for asking. So the the book is uh, it's truly a a map of the early stages of the innovation journey. And throughout my career, I've been very involved in product management and innovation. And I've noticed that a lot of the material out there is for B2C, so business to consumer. And so a lot of the books and the conferences and the examples and the classes. And for us that live in a B2B world, and especially me in the heavy industrial infrastructure type of, of solutions, there's not a lot. And a lot of the things that you say in B2C do not apply for B2B directly. And so I wanted to, to create a, a resource for people that are working on B2B that can help bring structure to the innovation journey on what does it really mean to go from idea to your first 10 customers? What are the different stages? What are the tools you need to do? And, and how do you go about it? So that has been the journey of writing that book. And it not only provides this structure framework that I call the B2B Innovators Map. Um, it also compiles 20 plus years of experience yeah, of me working exactly. in all these industries. Yeah. Yeah. I like that you call it a map. Uh, that's a good thing. It's a journey. It's a guidebook. Yeah. So when you say getting from that idea to the first 10 customers, why 10 customers? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I thought a lot about this because as I was working with a lot of companies as an independent consultant, or as part of my corporate jobs, I noticed that, especially working in Silicon Valley, everybody throws around abstract metrics for innovation progress. And so uh, the most common one I see there is getting to product market fit. Yeah. So everybody's getting to product market fit. That's everybody's the big working thing right on, now. Yeah. Right. But then you start digging deeper. And, and so what is it? What does it mean to get to product market fit? How do you know when you will reach? product market fit. And then everybody has a different answer. And every company has a different answer. Every team member has a different answer. So there's there's no cohesiveness there. I also have a podcast, the Enterprise Product Leadership Podcast. And I was lucky enough to interview uh, Steve Blank, which is you know the father yeah, of the startup. Sure. Um, and we discussed this and he said, yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it doesn't really have a, it, it's a very abstract term. And so what that means for me is that when you're building a new product in the B2B world, uncertainty, it's already hard enough. And if you don't have concrete milestones and concrete ways to communicate with your stakeholders on where you're going and how you're going to get there, it's even harder. And so what I've learned throughout the years is that 
10 seems to be a good heuristic of when you are reaching some market traction. Meaning when you're building a B2B product, you have to go through the sales cycle of your customer, the installation, maybe a pilot project. And not until you deploy a few systems, you know if you're actually delivering on that value, right? Getting the sale is not validation enough. And what I've encountered throughout my experience and talking to hundreds of people is that 10 is a good number of, if you're able to deliver value to 10 customers, then you have evidence of uh, market traction because by then you have seen all the things that can go wrong. You have fine tuned things. You know what it will take to deploy and operate a product in the field. So you can make realistic next step investment decisions, which is what product market fit was trying to do, right? So I'm not saying when you get to 10, just right. inject money and scale, right? All I'm <laughs> yeah. saying is by 10, you should be, you should have enough customer evidence to have discussions with your leadership team of what the next step should be. And in the book, I talk about possible options, right? But so the whole book is about getting to those 10, because again, in my experience, I'm talking to a ton of companies, most companies don't even get to those first 10. They die yeah. at one or two or three. And so getting to that 10 milestone, it's actually a lot harder than it seems in B2B. Yeah, you know, I wish, I'm thinking about the origin of Sophion and when we first came out with our product and I, that 10 resonates pretty well with me because I, I remember those early customers and each one was, there were similarities, but there were differences and there were challenges on each one. And, and you're like, oh, I haven't seen that before. Let's work through that one. Right. And then, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but you're mm -hmm. right. Once you get about 10, you, you've kind of, okay, I've seen enough variety here. I almost know what we're talking about. So I, I like that concept and it's very concrete, isn't it? 10. Good. Got it. Everybody can get to 10 and, and it's easy to measure, right? It's like, how far are you from 10? I'm yeah. at five. Then I need more sales or more this because we need to get there, right? I'm glad it resonates with you. And, and one very strong point that I make in the book as you're going through this journey is that those 10 have to have certain characteristics. The main one being they have to be within the same target market. Because I talk to many companies and I say, they tell me, well, we have, we're on our way. We have five customers. One is in automotive, one is in healthcare, one is in aviation, one is in commerce. That's not going to help you narrow down your problem space and make sure that you're converging into a solution that can be repeatable for that specific market. And so that's why earlier in the innovators map in the book, one key step is to figure out what that target market should be. And then you need to get 10, 10 of those. Yeah. Yeah. That, and again, if I go back to our own experience in Sofian, they were in the chemical industry. Had we been diverted into finance or retail or, or anything else, I don't think we would have learned enough to be successful in any one industry. Exactly. I, I really appreciate that, that, that comment because I think that sometimes when companies go in that direction is because they are more sales and opportunity driven as opposed to innovation driven because the, the goal of innovation, at least the way I see it, is to um, reduce risk of building something that nobody once, right? So you're increasing your chances of success. And so um, if you are led more by sales or by closing deals, the metrics change and you might get the deals short term. And that's how you end up with a collage of different types of companies, but you're not learning towards converging on the right problem so that you can scale. So you get a few deals here and there, but you don't, you can't scale them. And you don't learn. You don't learn. And you don't learn. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. You really want to validate your value proposition. You want to make sure you know and understand the value you're bringing. And it's going to be different by industry, isn't it? It is. It is. And, and I think that brings a really interesting point that, that I, I make in the book. And I have a lot of discussions with uh, executives all the time is that when you're getting to that point that you're deploying your first 10 customers, once you close your first customer, the perspective of the company changes a little bit and they say, yeah. oh, there's some money in here. We're going we're gonna to grow this account. We're going to penetrate it. We're going to win this deal. No, your first 10 are not profit generating deals. They are learning opportunities. You still have to deliver value. You still have to get paid, et cetera. 
But the goal is not to make money out of this. The goal is to learn whether you can grow. The next 10, the next 20, the next 100, that's where you start having a business. But I think as, as the innovator responsible for driving this process, you have to be very clear, setting those expectations with your leadership team that one, two, three customers, even though there's going to be some money coming in, it's you might be operating at a loss or the goal is not to. You're testing the models. You're testing all these different right, things. Right, right, right. And that's hard. It is. It is. But uh, <laughs> it's a very good point. And uh, Daniel, when you when you think about this, any type of products that you know, you, when you talk, we talk about products, new markets, new products. Are there any specific type of products that you're talking about here? Yeah, that's a great clarification. My my book and my experience has been in digital products. I've had the experience of working with software only products or software and hardware products. Uh, most software and hardware products are what we call connected products or IoT, Internet of Things products. So the book is about uh, all the techniques are around digital products, software and hardware, or software only or software and hardware together. Yeah, and I think there's very few hardware only products anymore, right? The connected yes. world is going so fast and moving so strongly that, uh, you know, either people already have a hard hardware product and they need to put a digital uh, capability around it, or they're coming right out of the gate with a combined digital physical product. So I think it's very relevant. It is, and a lot of the innovation that I'm involved with as an independent consultant is I work with companies that either have new products or they have existing hardware products and they are making the transition to making it an intelligent product, which means adding the software and the connectivity but again, that, that is a completely different business model, right? So a, a lot of the stages of the innovation journey in the book apply to that, right? If you have an existing product, but you're really looking to transition from a hardware transactional type of business model to a software-driven, data-driven, software-as-a-service type of thing, yeah, you have to go through this innovation journey. Yeah. How would a company start? You know, give, give that first part of your map, map to us. <laughs> Tease us a little bit. <laughs> yeah, of course. I appreciate that. Um, I, I struggled with including this as the first step. So the first step in the map, so the map has six stages. And the first step is strategic alignment. And I struggled a little bit with whether I should include that as a stage because I thought, you know, any company needs to be aligned before they go into innovation. But the more I talk to companies, that is a big, big hurdle. And what happens is that they skip one or two or three steps, and then they are investing in product development, but they're not aligned strategically. And so the first step is about getting alignment within your executive team on what customer problem you are looking to explore. And there's a few things there that I like to point out, right? It's, it's about the customer pain. It's not about you. It's like, it's not your company needs more revenue or your company needs to open a new geography. It's like, what customer problem are you want to explore? And the second part is exploring because you don't know that you're going to find a, an opportunity to build a product to meet that need. But as long as you have the agreement on the specific problem to explore, so for example, we want to help our customers reduce their cost of their electricity bill. Okay, that's enough alignment for the innovation team to take it to the next stages of the journey. But sometimes it's really it's really hard to, to get there. And in the book, I, I give specific techniques that innovators can use to get that alignment across multiple business units and departments uh, in their organization. Yeah, yeah, it's a fun, uh, fun, fun read, fun concept. Now let's talk industries. You've, uh, you're personally f active in energy. You've mentioned that. I think climate may be something you're, you're very. Uh, tell us more about what you're doing. Yeah, so of course. So um, I've always been very passionate about uh, using technology to fight climate change, and I've had the opportunity to work in uh, energy industries and more in the uh, what's called the energy transition, so moving away from fossil fuels. It's a fascinating space, and it just happens to combine a lot of the areas that I am passionate about. So it's mostly B2B type of solutions. Digitalization is a very big component. Most of those solutions are a combination of hardware and software, so connected solutions. And so this type of applications include virtual power plants, energy storage, distributed energy resources, electric vehicles, charging infrastructure, all those kind of things that are needed to 
to get away from that energy efficiency in buildings and all those kind of things. So all of those are digital solutions for B2B that have a component of software and hardware. So that's, they all fit together nicely into, into my, my expertise. Yeah, that's super. Are you focused mostly when you're in your consultancy side, when you're talking with companies, is it, is it uh, North America, Latin America, South America? Where, where do you see, uh, where do you spend a lot of time? It's mostly um, North America, uh, United States, and then Europe, UK, Germany. Those are the, the main things um, that I see, but mostly yeah. is the United States. I'd love to hear what you think about this because we are very active as well in our software. It's a, it supports companies, manage their innovation. And, you know, we see in certain areas of the world really wanting to measure, assess, put a stake in the ground to make an assessment on a, let's say a new product idea and how it fits with environmental sustainability, right? Huge need in Europe. Everybody's talking about it. The United States, less so. That's what what I see as I'm out there talking to companies. Are you seeing the same? I am seeing the same that a, a lot less people seem to be talking about it per se in your in your everyday. But when you dive deeper into the uh, renewable energy, the clean tech industry, a lot of the activity is happening here in the United States. Okay. So ah, okay. a lot of the companies, e even the large corporations that are not based here, you know, the, the Siemens and those type of companies, they have a strong foothold here and their innovation groups on those areas are usually here. Um, Silicon Valley is actually one of the hottest hubs for climate tech these days. A lot of the venture is there and a lot of the startups are here in the United States. It's, it's a very big, I'm, I'm fortunate to be a mentor in two of the top climate tech accelerators, Greentown Labs and Third Derivative. And you see a lot of, of companies, mostly for the, from the U.S. with all these yeah. technologies. So. Can you tell us more about those labs? That's very interesting. Yes. So it's, it's fascinating because as with any accelerator, the, the goal of an accelerator is to bring in startups and provide them resources to grow. And so I've, I've worked in generic, quote unquote, generic accelerators where I've helped the companies with innovation product strategy, those kind of things. Um, what is really interesting about climate specific accelerators, a few things. One is that everybody is involved in climate, right? So then you have a big network of other companies. Second is that they provide the necessary resources for people to drive their climate solutions and technology is an important area. That's the, the, the area that I play with, but because a lot of, um, climate solutions depend on policy, there are a lot of support from the accelerators on policy okay. and what they could, lobbying and those kind of things. Yeah. Um, and then some of them have uh, very interesting labs where people can actually test out their hardware and their software, their solutions, right? Mm -hmm. um, some of these accelerators, they're focused more generically in, in everything around climate. So it's not only energy, but water conservation, methane reduction, carbon capture. And so you have this fascinating ecosystem in there and, and they are able to bring in venture money. They're being able to bring corporates that would serve as the partnerships. They're bringing a lot of the policy heavy hitters, you know, the people from the Department of Energy and the US, et cetera. And then people that are product strategists like myself to help them with the actual product. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing. Yeah. Do you see it as, is it, would you call it a public private or, or is there, is, is the public uh, funding m merging with the private funding in, in these places? It's starting to, they're mostly private, mostly private, yeah. mostly private because the goal is to create these companies that can be private. And usually a big portion of the buyers of this technology is going to be the public sector. And so the accelerators work with private companies to help them get to scale and be able to sell to the government. And, and that's why policy is so important. And, and now, um, you know, there's very uh, 
prominent people in the in the industry, like Jigar Shaw, which is a very well known entrepreneur and, and CEO and executive for the energy industry. Now he leads the Department of Energy Loans. I forget the name. And so you can see out all of those relationships, and 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 those people are linked with the accelerators and the corporates to produce the products and then sell to either utilities or public sector. So. It's interesting because, for example, transportation is a big thing. So electrification of public fleets, right? Converting all the buses in the United States government to electric. Well, what does that entail? It's not only the bus, but it's the charging, it's the software, it's the maintenance of exactly. so that whole ecosystem. So yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And yeah. Fantastic ecosystem. Yeah. It's a fantastic ecosystem. And, and I really like it for many reasons. One of them is the technology is incredible. For example, I, I used to be head of products at a company doing energy storage. And so you, you were able to build these virtual power plants through the Internet of Things and have all these batteries stored in multiple buildings around a city. And if the utility is having a hot day like here in Austin and they need extra power, instead of turning on a dirty picker plant that's going to you know burn a lot of coal, they can just signal through the internet all these independent batteries that group together and discharge to the grid. And so all that technology, all that is the digital technology that I work on, which is fascinating. It has a big impact. It enables a humongous commercial opportunity for these companies. This transition is, is humongous for that. And it's amazing, right? So my goal with, with my book and the work that I do is, is to get my to, to provide structure to as many climate tech companies in their innovation journey so that we can we can get it right faster because we don't have a lot of time to lose on, on this. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a hot hot issue and and you know I know in Europe they're uh they're they're really struggling with accelerating some of their energy programs because of because of the war in Ukraine and, and the you know the gas being the natural gas challenges uh that are coming out of Russia. So they're all thinking, okay, how do we accelerate our programs? So it's probably a lot of uh I'm, I it's really encouraging to hear that there's a lot of funding for startups and innovation in this area because that's you the, you don't see the government having to push it. It sounds like the private sector is saying, hey there's great opportunities here. We're gonna go after them. Yeah, it's been really interesting um, to see. I think the last year was record year of venture capital money invested in climate tech. There was more money flowing to climate related startups than even AI, which is wow. like a hot word. So yeah. the amount of money going into these companies, it's incredible. And then from one end, you know, people are interested in, in the, the doing good, so to speak. But the reality is that the economic potential of these solutions is huge, right? They, they say that the next trillion dollar industry is going to be a climate industry, a climate company. And so there's a lot of capital that needs to go in. The opportunity is huge. But unfortunately, this type of solutions are very capital intensive. So they need a lot of money to be able to get up to scale. And that's why going back to the importance of innovation, when you have something that it's uh, critically pressing, you know, like climate change, it's very complicated to do. It's very capital intensive. You're going to have to try to get it right the first time because you don't have, this is not like a dating app that you can iterate until you get right. it right. Yeah, it's like, sure. you're gonna, it's a lot harder. So that's why I'm very bullish in, in applying my expertise, you know, and help as much as I can to help companies get it right the first time by, by providing structure to the innovation journey. Yeah, this is a fantastic discussion. I mean, I can't imagine anybody listening not who's not on the edge of their seat right now because this sounds really fun <laughs> and exciting. I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> so am I. <laughs> well, Daniel, uh, any anything else you'd like to share? It's been a wonderful discussion. I really appreciate you stopping by to join us. But are there any other last minute things you wanted to share with us? Anything I forgot to ask about or? <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate this discussion. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your show. Uh, I would say the work that, that you're doing as well is extremely important, right? In driving innovation the right way with the right tools is very important. And if I may, I like to just say if people are interested in, in this type of information, uh, my book, the B2B Innovators Map is, is out there and, and you can go to b2binnovator.com and um, that takes you to my website and you can download a free chapter if you want free to check chapter. it out but yeah 
Yeah, no, I encourage everybody to check that out. We'll make sure we put links in the show notes uh, for your, your webpage and the book. Appreciate that. And Daniel, if people want to kind of follow you, uh, keep track of what you're doing, are you active out there anywhere? How, how can they keep in touch with you, follow you? Thank you. Yes, I, I am pretty active, uh, uh, mostly on LinkedIn. I do a lot of uh, uh, talks and, and webinars and events, uh, especially now with the book. My website has all my information, danielelisalde.com, and you can find everything there. I have my podcast there, a lot of articles, uh, videos, my IoT courses. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that I do there. And then just uh, I'm on LinkedIn and, and I'm on Twitter. So just uh, ping me and I, I love to continue the discussion. That's great. That's great. Well, this is this has been very, very exciting. And I hope I hope a lot of people do reach out to you because energy, climate, innovation, it's just the, the melting pot of all of that is, is, is just super. <laughs> so have a great, uh, great week ahead, Daniel. Really, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Paul. I really appreciate this conversation and I look forward to keeping in touch. Yeah, let's do that. Let's check in again and see how the book's going and so maybe some additional things you've been learning. Maybe back end of the year, we can touch base. I would love that. Yeah, good. We'll do that. And uh, to you folks out there listening, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I think it's a fascinating topic. It's a topic that's uh, top of mind for, for many people. And uh, it's just been a thrill to, to talk to somebody who's active in it. Do check out the book and check out the website and reach out to, to Daniel. I wish you all a great week ahead. We'll talk to you next time. Until then, bye for now. Thanks for joining us this week for Innovation Talks with Paul Heller. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, or wherever you listen to podcasts. For additional information on today's topic, check out sophion.com, S-O-P-H-E-O-N.com, where you will find plenty of innovation-centric content and corporate best practices. If you'd like to discuss anything with Paul or would like to get in touch with the show, email us at talks at sophion.com.